Well, good morning. My name is David. Welcome to Walden Community Church. You know, for the past couple weeks, as summer's been winding down, I've been trying to find just sermons that I could preach just one of, right? I'm not doing a, a sermon series right now. And when I'm thinking about something I would like to preach on, I typically lean towards a book study because there's a lot of content there, or uh, an excerpt from Jesus's life because, well, that's just good storytelling. But that's not what you typically want the most. Pastors are a lot like DJs. Uh, we get people that come up to us afterwards and they have requests and they have their own top 10 list. Probably will not surprise you to hear that everybody wants studies on Revelation, Satan, angels, and what happens when you die. Especially questions about heaven. Like, is it true that, you know, our pets go to heaven? Can we still play golf in heaven? Is heaven real? They're all great questions. C.S. Lewis once said, we are very shy nowadays of even mentioning heaven. We are afraid of the jeer about pie in the sky and of being told that we are trying to escape the duty of making a happy world here, and now by dreaming of a happy world elsewhere. But either there is pie in the sky or there is not. If there is not, then Christianity is false, for this doctrine is woven into its whole fabric. If there is, then this truth must be faced, whether it is useful at political meetings or no. Recent studies say that about 80% of Americans believe that heaven is real. Of course, we hear stories about heaven, right? We have people that have near-death experiences uh, from time to time, people who say they saw a bright light. We have accounts of people who hear voices. Uh, and in the Bible, we also have people that have experience with heaven before they die, like Elijah and Enoch, or the fact that Revelation, right, is John's record of being in heaven. And the Bible uses the word heaven 532 times. The Hebrew word for heaven is shamayim, and it means heights, it means elevations. In fact, it's the, in the very first sentence of the Bible, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Last week, we read Jesus's words. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come back take you to be with me so that you can be where I am. And we said that Jesus in this moment is acting like a Hebrew groom. He builds us a home, builds us a home in eternity. So what is this place like? What does the Bible tell us? And what misconceptions do we have about it? I mean, just show of hands, who wants to go to heaven? Who wants to go to heaven right now? Who wants to go to heaven right now? No, not right. Everybody, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? Heaven's a wonderful thing, just as long as it's far, far, far in the future. In Spain, where Christopher Columbus died, there is a memorial to him. And below it is a Latin inscription, ne plus ultra. It means no more beyond. However, in the memorial, there's a lion, and he is tearing down the word no, which makes it plus ultra, because as Columbus proved, there is more beyond. In our case, Jesus promised us more beyond. So today our focus is on the descriptions of that more beyond. Or more directly, we're gonna ask the question of the Bible, what is heaven like? But before we can get there, let's first tear down any misconceptions about what we already have about heaven. So let's look at the top five myths Top five myths about heaven. You ready? All right. Myth number one. There is only one heaven in the Bible. What? Yeah. Myth number one. There's only one heaven in the Bible. I mentioned earlier that the word heaven appears a lot in the Bible. Not all of those words are about where God lives. And almost none of them are about the place you will live in all eternity. What do I mean? Well, heaven number one in the Bible is the sky. Psalm 78 says, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. Heaven number two is what we would call 
outer space. Psalm 19 says their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. Heaven number three is where God lives right now. Jesus calls it his father's house. Jesus is also there right now, so are the angels. In fact, there are myriads of angels and heavenly beings serving the Lord in heaven. We see that in John's depiction of Revelation. Heaven number four is the future home of all believers. Let's reread a passage that we read last week. 2 Peter 3. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. What is that a picture of? Like halfway through this, what are we already seeing? Total destruction, right? Everything's gone. The universe is gone. Everything God has made, planets, earth, the stars, it's all gone. Verse 11 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? And here it is. Here's what I want to show you. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The Bible talks about God getting a new residence and we get a new residence. God gets a new heaven and we get a new earth, which means there is a heaven now and there's a new heaven later. Myth number two. Nobody is in heaven right now. That's the second myth. Nobody's in heaven right now. Maybe you've heard this referenced as soul sleep, or you've heard the word purgatory. And it's this idea that there is a waiting room, or there's this quiet period for, you know, for the people who've died, but the doors aren't open in heaven yet, so no one's allowed in. And you have to wait until the last day. But the Bible says that there are people there now. Genesis 25, 8 says, Abraham is there now. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. The Bible says the Jewish people are there right now. Judges 2, 10 says all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 5, says that we should want to go to heaven. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So Paul says, I'd rather be away from all of this, be away from the body, separate from my body, and I would rather be home where God is right now. He says, I would rather be in heaven with them. Philippians 1 says, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is better. Acts 7 says, and as they were stoning Stephen, Stephen calls out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In other words, he's saying, take me home. And then most famously, Jesus tells the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. Right? Jesus said it. This day. So it, if you don't believe me that there are people in heaven right now, believe Jesus. I believe the Bible tells us that those who have already gone ahead of us, they are in the same heaven where God currently lives. But they are also waiting for Christ's return. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, in other words, those who die, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So there it is, right there. When Christ returns, those who have already died return here with him. And then it goes on. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Myth number three. 
Heaven is so far away that the people up there can't see us. Have you ever thought that before? Why do we think that? Well, because there's a lot of horrible things that take place here on the earth, right? And, and you know, we just had a terrible fire in Hawaii, killed 100 people. It's now the deadliest wildfire in 105 years. Uh, before that, I remember Butte County, California, uh, back in 2018. Back when I lived 83 miles from Butte County, we had ash falling in our own yard. But if people in heaven could see that, right? If they could see those horrors that happen, if the people in heaven could see our suffering, then they would be sad. And if they're sad, then it can't be heaven. Have you ever heard that? Matthew 17 says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses and Elijah are not only in heaven, right? So there's people in heaven. <laughs> but then they get to go on a field trip to earth. So heaven can't be that far away. And you don't think that when they were here, they looked around? You don't think that they, when they were here, they talked to Jesus about his struggles? Jesus says very famously in Luke 15, just so I tell you, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Tell me something, how do the people in heaven know that a person has repented? How do they know to celebrate and to rejoice if they can't see what's happening here? I'll even give you some more evidence. The martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, the Bible says they cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before will you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? What is this about? Well, it means that there are also martyrs in heaven, more evidence of people in heaven. <laughs> there are martyrs in heaven and they are aware of what is happening and they cry out, which means they have voices. It means God can hear them. They have God's... Uh, God's attention, right? And they say, how long? Which means they have an understanding of the distance of time. They are aware of the passage of time. Even though time takes place here on earth, right? In heaven, it's, all, it's eternal. Time takes place here. They have an audience with God, and then they ask for justice. That means they have a concern. They're aware. They ask for justice because they see injustice in the world, and they ask God to rectify that. It also implies that they remember their time on earth. They remember that they were martyred because they say, when will you avenge us? And the next verse says, in verse 11, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Each one of those people are given a white robe to wear, which means they are each individual people. They have physical bodies, right, to wear robes. And God says, wait longer. Again, a reference to time and the knowledge of the passing of time. So yes, I believe the Bible says that not only are there people in heaven, but they are aware of the passage of time and what takes place on earth. Myth number four. Heaven will be so different than it is now, we can't even imagine it. <laughs> Revelation 22, this is John's vision of heaven. This is how he describes it. Then the angel showed me the river of, of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Tell me something. Have you ever seen a street before? <laughs> what about a city? What about a river? You ever seen a tree? Have you ever seen fruit? <laughs> uh, sounds like pretty familiar objects to me. 
Hebrews 11 says, For Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Hebrews 11:16 says, They desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Here we see words of cities with foundations, a heavenly country. I think our new earth, where we will live for all eternity, will actually feel very grounded, very familiar. I'm sure it'll be glorious. I'm sure it'll be perfect. But I don't think we need to worry that it'll be so unrecognizable. Myth number five, there is no mourning or crying or pain in heaven. What? N no, I, I, want my, I want my money back, right? I want my, I want my money back. Well, well first, let's just remember what we've learned so far. There are people in heaven right now. They can see and they are aware of what's taking place here. And we even see some of them asking to be avenged. The Bible says that they cry out, which means that their words are tense, anxious, right? But I do remember that there is a verse that talks about there being no tears in heaven, right? So where is that? Well, it's in Revelation 21. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall be there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So there it is. But this goes back to the very first myth, right? Because there is more than one heaven mentioned in the Bible. And this passage that we remember so famously, Revelation 21, is talking about what takes place after the second coming, after Jesus comes again. Where God lives now, that realm is still aware of what takes place here. So we still have pain in the world. There is still injustice going on. And the people and the beings who live in heaven are aware of that. Genesis 6 says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. Where does God live? God lives in heaven, and in heaven, God experiences regret. God experiences grief. Ephesians 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit can feel grief in heaven. So yes, while it is true that once Christ comes and there is a new heaven and a new earth, then things will be perfect. Then there will be no more tears, no more pain. But things are not perfect yet. The marriage between the lamb and us has not yet taken place. The marriage of the bridegroom has not yet taken place. So until Christ returns again, there will be unrest. There will be tension, even in heaven. We are all waiting. We are all waiting for that tension to be broken. We are waiting for Christ's return. Then there will be no more sadness. Then there will be no more tears. So I know I said top five myths, right? I said top five, I have one more, but I don't know how to label this one because it's not only uh, a myth, I think it's also a feeling. I think it's this unspoken thing. We, you know, we mentioned this a little bit when we talked about the marriage between the bride and the groom. And even the week before that, when we talked about worship, it's just this idea that right now, earth and where we live is like one giant waiting room in a hospital. You know, you get that feeling like we're just called to sit around and read old copies of Newsweek. We are waiting for our name to be called. And then we'll graduate. 
right? We get to go into that closed door that's ahead of us. We get, we get that deluxe apartment in the sky. This is boot camp, but we're not, we're not enlisted yet, or, or this is a study hall, and we're not enrolled yet. This is practice of what's to come. We're waiting it out, or we're just passing through. And here's the thing, and I think this is bigger. This idea, I think, is bigger than just calling it a myth, because this isn't something that we just believe. This is something that moves into our actions, and we live this. This is not how Jesus wants us to live. Jesus does not want us to wait idly for his return. Waiting idly for his return is devoid of mission. Church has work to do. The church has work to do. The young women that we read about a week ago, their work was to keep their lamps lit. The servants in that same chapter in Matthew 25, they were told to work, to multiply their master's money, not bury it. The ones who buried it were called lazy. The ones who multiplied it were rewarded. John the Baptist says that we should prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. None of that language is lazy. None of that language implies waiting, twiddling thumbs, waiting room, staring at the clock, behavior. In fact, 2 Peter says, live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That is how we should be thinking of heaven. We should be looking forward to heaven and working to speed the day that Christ returns. How? Well, the answer to that <laughs> is another use of the word heaven in the Bible. And it's the most popular use that Jesus uses. Because when Jesus spoke of heaven, he did not refer to it as the sky. He did not refer to it as outer space. He referred to it as a kingdom. But not just the kingdom where God lives or the kingdom that is to come. Jesus' message was about the kingdom of heaven now, today. He said, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's here. When Jesus sent out the 72, we read about that many weeks ago, he sent his disciples with a very simple message. He says, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are with there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. That's the good news right there. That is the good news. That is the message that transformed lives. That means those first people who heard that gospel message, the good news to them was not, one bright morning when my work is done, I'll fly away. That was not the good news. The good news was not coming in the distant future. The good news was here, presently, now. Yes, you will get a new body in the afterlife, and that is great. But when you become a Christian, you get a new heart immediately. Ezekiel 11 says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. I believe that every disciple who heard Jesus that first time when he taught them how to pray, when he gave them the Lord's Prayer, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he prayed out the Lord's Prayer. That prayer contains one of the greatest lines in all of Scripture. And it is our current mission. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means, for the Christian, it is less about getting there and it's more about bringing there here. I'll say it again. 
because I think this is so important concerning heaven and our ideas about heaven and our hopes for heaven. For the Christian, it is less about getting there and it is more about bringing there here. I wrote you a little poem, okay? (laughs) I wrote you a little poem to help you remember this. Not harps, nor robes, nor clouds, nor pearly gates, not halos or an all-you-can-eat buffet. The church should care less about tomorrow and more about today. We have a mission. We have a message. Our mission for today is to prepare the way of the Lord. Our message is the kingdom of heaven is here. Because you know what? The outside world, those who watch us, they already know where we want to go. They already know that. They know that we are excited about tomorrow. But the outside world, they are nervous about today. And I think the best witness that we can be, our greatest testimony will be a church whose mission is on earth as it is in heaven. In Matthew 25, we see the wise and the foolish wedding guests. Lower than that, Jesus says this. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did to the least one of these, my brothers, you did also to me. On earth, as it is in heaven, means we give food to the hungry. We refresh the thirsty. We welcome strangers. We clothe the naked. We care for the sick. We visit the people in prison. We bring about the realization of God's kingdom. We prepare the way. I heard a podcast uh, this, this year, and it was from a guy who decided to run the numbers. He ran all the numbers for the United States concerning the amount of homelessness in America and the amount of uh, orphans in America. So that would be kids who either need adoption or who just need foster parents. And do you know what he found out? That there are a lot of churches in America. And he said if every church in America, every church in America, if they had just one family in their congregation, and that one family adopted or fostered a child, every kid in America would have a home. That there's one kid for every one church. And he found that if every church in America helped one homeless person get off the streets, homelessness would be a thing of the past. Just one. When Jesus was here, he gave us a really great model to follow. He lived a life of compassion and loving and healing. And he did it, he did it all for the least of these. James 1 says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so when we show compassion to the last, to the lost, to the least, when we fulfill our obligations to care for God's creation, to care for the widow, to care for the orphan, we speed the day. We speed the day of Christ's return. It seems lately the world is trying to drive us all apart. The world is trying to drive a wedge between groups. The news, politicians are trying to turn us against each other, whether it's party against party, denominations against denominations, Protestant against Catholic. Titus 3.10 says, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Why? Because division is a sin. 
And if you don't believe me, get this. The word for division in the Greek is the word heretic. That is what a heretic is. When Jesus was here, he was highly opposed to people who picked sides and who created division, who built walls of separation, who created hierarchy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, for in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all made to drink of one spirit. If we can learn to put our differences aside and remember that we are one family and we treat each other as brothers and sisters, then we will help bring about the realization of God's kingdom and we will speed the day of Christ's return. When Jesus went to be with his father, you know what he didn't say? He didn't say, wait right there, I'll be right back. Just hang out right there. I'll be right back. He did not say that. <laughs> no, what he said was, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. God is not done with his love for the world. We can't be done either. We have work to do. We have a mission. We have a message. God's kingdom come. His will be done. God is the one who transforms the world. Yes, but he is doing it through us. And it is our privilege to be a part of it. So let us continue to bring heaven to earth. Let's pray together. Lord, we are waiting for heaven. We are all anxious for it and excited about it. Each one has our thoughts, ideas, or pictures of what heaven will be like. And yet only you know the day, only you know the hour. So while we are here, while we have this time, we are privileged to have these precious minutes. Help us to use them wisely to bring about your kingdom, to prepare the way, to spread the good news. May our feet be happy to bring this good news to those who need to hear messages of forgiveness, messages of justice, messages of peace, of grace, of love. May each church welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, feed the sick, and look after the orphan and the widow. And may we all hasten the day because we can't wait to see you again. Amen. Hey, we're here. We are here in Montgomery, Texas. We are in the Walden community, and we would love to have you here with us. We have two services every Sunday. We have a 930 service, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing songs out of the hymnal. We're going to have responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. It's going to feel just like the church that you grew up in. At 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service with a worship band. Please come casual. Come as you feel comfortable. And we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.